Hello everybody. This is Tom Bronack. You can see my name and contact information down here. Today I'm going to provide you with an executive briefing on the dashboard system I created. And that dashboard system has an executive level dashboard, which is the top tier, and has sub tiers for infrastructure, systems development lifecycle, recovery management, and compliance. Under the recovery management, there is another sub tier for application recovery certification or the IT environment. And the second is for business locations uh, where you would have an evacuation and perhaps a relocation. What I'm going to do is whenever a, a, an evacuation or any kind of <coughs> uh, recovery plan is activated, problems can arise. And when they do, an action item is filled and completed and then forwarded on to the contingent command center. Their function is to respond to all uh, recovery actions, either in a test mode or a real active disaster recovery, so they can coordinate operations. They, in turn, communicate the emergency operations center, whose function is to try to keep the business running as smoothly as possible, <clears throat> even if a disaster event was to occur. And finally, it's the executive management or C-level management that gets involved. Now, C-level management, their function is to provide a single image to the outside world. And that includes the media, clients, employees, the general community, which is somebody you might be sharing a building with or a building or a business complex with, the government facilities, and families of those people who may be affected by the disaster event. All right, let's start looking at the dashboard. First thing I'm doing is the infrastructure. And you can see we can quickly get to it. Now the infrastructure, today we're going to talk about uh, asset management and that has to do with, uh, uh, it has to do with the uh, acquisition, redeployment, and termination of equipment and the use of the infrastructure team to help perform those functions. Whenever a new application is to be built, it re may require resources. And if it does require resources, then those resources have got to be ordered. And once they're ordered, they're going to have to be installed. The process by which that happens is shown here, where you would start out with an engineer or an architect coming in, into the scene and designing the environment and determining which types of equipment should be employed. The resources are then identified, uh, the various vendors, and uh, the resources are selected. They're ordered, delivered, and installed. And once they're installed, the inventory is updated for the global company, and the configuration is updated for the site. <clears throat> Should the employee who's using that piece of equipment either leave the, the company or be promoted to a higher job or be relocated to a different, different site, then their equipment would have to be redeployed. It begins with, you would have to erase all of the data or the personal information that's on the computer. That's to a company standard. Next you would do is to delete unnecessary programs. You would then move the equipment to its new location and install and register the equipment within, by updating the inventories appropriately. Either the sites, you would delete it from the original site, add it to a new site, and add that in, whatever information is pertinent to the global inventory. <coughs> Excuse me, to show you how easy it is to change this, I noticed that the new is in lowercase, and I kind of wanted it in uppercase, so I made the change right there. Uh, termination of equipment then uh, has to comply to a higher level because when you're terminating equipment, it's leaving your premise. And when it leaves your premise, it should not have any data on it that could be company related in any way, means, or fashion. So the data is, is erased to uh, the Department of Defense standard. And that's because if there's critical information on the data, on the uh, equipment such as uh, medical information, then you would be in violation of HIPAA, or financial information, which you would be in violation of many, many financial laws. 
You can then donate, sell, use the equipment for DR, or scrap it. Uh, if you're using it for, for DR, then you could place it in a business recovery site where the horsepower of a piece of equipment may not be as strong or, or as strongly needed as in a production environment, and that would extend your equipment life cycle and save you some money in a recovery site. If you scrap the pieces of the equipment, it's very, very wise to make sure that you're scrapping it in accordance to the EPA Superfund uh, guidelines because there are chemicals and other damaging uh, resources within a computer that could harm somebody. And if you get if your piece of equipment is found in a dump site by the EPA and you're not certified as uh, eliminating the piece of equipment to standard, then you can be fined a lot of money. So you have to update the registration of the equipment at that time by deleting it from the global inventory and deleting it from the site inventory. <clears throat> the last thing is the infrastructure team. This team of people perform a lot of tasks, more so than you would understand uh, in simply looking at this. But in this particular case, they would be involved with picking up the equipment, performing all the erasures, maintaining the status of the equipment, and reporting to the requester for whatever service they required. To take a better look at how this can be used, if you have multiple locations that are distributed all over the place under different control, and you want to gain control of your equipment, you may want to build production recovery centers and connect the or move the equipment to those centers so that they would be under your control. You can have centers in like the Americas, in Europe, and Asia. So the first thing we do is an inventory of all the equipment at all of the remote sites. You would use that inventory to calculate the size of the production data centers that you need to build. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once you build the production data centers, you're also going to have to protect them by recovery. So how do you build a recovery site? Again, you calculate the size requirement of the recovery site based on the size of the production data centers and the number of critical applications that are contained there that would have to have recovery services performed. Now, in the recovery site, you initially start out with a, a pool of available resources. Whenever an application is designated as going through recovery testing or recovery certification, the pool of resources are then depleted to add to the resources required to perform that recovery service. So managing your recovery site is what's available, taking away what's dedicated, and whatever's left over is available for the next application that's going through certification. It's a way of managing your recovery site's resources. The services that are provided by the infrastructure are many. They prepare sites, uh, including the facility itself, the environment, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning, electricity, water, all that stuff. They provide raised floors when necessary. They provide wiring to the user location. They provide PBX or private branch exchange and phone coordination so that the users have both the commuters that they need as well as the phones and other services that they need to support their function. Offices and seating arrangements are also under the control of the facilities people. Onboarding preparation for new hires and transfers is also under their control. They would have to set up the cubicle or the office for that new person. Wi-Fi, internet, intranet, all that communication uh, stuff has to be supported and the wires needed to connect to it, supported by the infrastructure group. Workstation setup and maintenance performed by them. Supplies are initiated and uh, supplied throughout the organization under their control. And in essence, they provide general support for the needs of the staff. In performing this project, I never, this project, the dashboard was there to uh, make it easy to get to accurate and current information as fast as possible. It was not meant to be uh, a project that would have metrics involved with it. But as it turned out, metrics fell out. Uh, for example, we can find out how many active projects or total projects are in the pipeline of those, how many are active, how many are pending, the number of people assigned to them, what their hourly rate is, 
the number of hours needed to perform a specific assignment, the total hours, the total hours that have been spent already, the total hours that are pending, and what the total cost, active cost, and pending cost is, and what percentage of completion is done. All of that can be projected in a graph. When you change the numbers, the graph change. Who knew? I never expected it to happen, but it did, and it works throughout the whole dashboard system. Forms management control is also a very needed and production uh, productivity losing uh, situation, but it can be improved upon by following this routine. Uh, when the user comes on, he has a fill out a form, but he really doesn't know which form he needs, so an interface can be provided to help him select the right form. That form would then be selected from the forms library and provided to the user. Along with that form would be a help screen that would tell him all about the form and what it's used for. When he enters the fields and hits enter, the date entry validation would come about to make sure he completed the fields correctly. If not, an error message will be provided in a little box providing him with information related to that field so that he could complete the field properly. Once the form is done, it's then moved to a router. The router would then authorize the form and assign it. It would be assigned from the first person performing the work to the last person and tracked and the activity logged. An interactive communications facility will allow the user to get to the person actually performing the work so that he can communicate any changes or gather any status information he needs at that time. All changes and a history of the events will be stored in an audit trail. Once it's completed and accepted, a chargeback can be used because the user is a purchase order, is a work order, and all of these steps here are purchase orders used to satisfy that work order. The chargeback can be then generated, sent to accounting, and then reported on. Personnel who have to work on an assignment have to have skills. So we need to know what skills they have so they can perform the work properly. We start out with a job title, a job description, the functional responsibilities assigned to that person, what tools he uses or she uses, and what skill level they presently are at, either a beginner, an intermediate, or an expert. Whatever documentation they need to, need to perform their function is provided, and this current level, current skill level is recorded. Any skill improvements that are needed are noted, and training needs are identified and scheduled. We also would like to know the individual's career path goals so we can try to help him achieve that anytime we can. As ongoing work grows, additional staffing may be required to supplement the existing staff because the workload is just too heavy for them to handle. So we would go through the recruitment process to get somebody or train people from the pool of people to get them ready to help assign that assigned person. Each person in the company would have an entry in the learning skills index, which they would list all their skills and at what level they're at. If training is needed that can't be done in-house, then Maybe a vendor can provide the training, such as a VM certified uh, professional. And in that case, they would go to the vendor, and the vendor would train the person and provide a certification. If, the, if it's training that's not provided by a vendor, but is provided by a university, either in, through online or classroom, then we can send the individual to that university, and he can get accreditation for the work he's accomplished. Both the certification and the accreditation can then be added to the personnel skills matrix and profile. Finally, a complete list overview of what would happen is we would have an automated personnel system, an automated training system, and a user interface that is internet or intranet based so that this can be accessed from any place at any time through the internet. Users would have profiles, a tracking library library would be used to see what is currently active, what was active in the past and completed, and what's pending for future use. A database library would be used for forms, and a documentation library would be used for flat files such as standards, procedures, manuals, and anything else that's not a database. When a user makes a request, that's logged. It's then assigned to an individual and tracked from the first individual to the last 
All the time spent working on it is uh, measured, analyzed, and reported upon. And by doing this, you'll be able to make improvements to your workflow and enhance productivity and the efficiency of your organization. So now if you look so now we looked at the infrastructure, let's look at the system development lifecycle. System development lifecycle is broken into development or maintenance, testing, quality assurance, production acceptance, and then finally into production where support is, is supplied to the production application. Whenever, uh, whenever testing is done, it can be done under a VM environment in which you can actually take a copy of the production environment, put it into the VM environment, and do your testing and recovery testing against that. Quality Assurance looks at the support data to make sure it's accurate, current, and everything that's needed is there. Production Acceptance sets up the production environment, including the run books to make sure they're clear and accurate, and then it's, produced, it's run in the production environment. If an error occurs, support will then look for the root cause of that problem, and if a fix to the problem requires a change, then a change management request would be uh, issued. The change management request will say that we have to update the version of the production environment by one. So if we're currently at version 1.0, we would have to go to version 1.1. Change management would have a review board that would look at all pending changes and either approve them or reject them. If they're rejected, for a reason, then the change management will go over again until that problem is fixed. If it is accepted, then it would go, the problem would either be repaired, the update would be made, the enhancement made through the maintenance environment. Now the maintenance environment would take whatever was in the development environment, which is release 1.0, and then bring it over to the maintenance environment, make 1.1, and apply the changes to that new environment. It would go through testing, QA, production acceptance, and back into production. This is a looping event that's ongoing. This development is a one-time event. How it looks in the real world is you go from development through testing, quality assurance, and so on like that throughout the world. The user provides the following information. The business purpose for the application, the business data associated with it, who the owner of that data is, how sensitive and critical the data is, and who's allowed to use it. This is all used for access control. Backup and recovery is also defined for critical data. When a user also uh, provides the application request, he also says, well, the application is going to be run from this location. I'm afraid if I lose this location, I still have to be able to provide that work. So what I need is a business recovery facility. Just like the data center has a disaster recovery facility, the business has to have a recovery facility so that they can transfer their staff from the failing location to the business recovery site and pick up business from there. It could then be connected to either the production site or the disaster recovery site as needed. The production environment does backups. In the old world, they used to tape backups every day and at the end of the week, and they would storm in an offsite vault. Today, they do online backups either in real time or through incremental backups. But even greater, if you have VM, there is a product called Recovery Point application that would synchronize data between the production site and a disaster recovery site so that you could pick up uh, in a recovery mode the application much more quickly. This is explained both the VM side here and the RPA side here. When you're doing testing under the VM world, the successful test results from, a, from a, an application test and a recovery test are added to the quality assurance uh, documentation and brought into production. <clears throat> When you have a life cycle for system development, there are checkpoints involved. The first checkpoint would be a buy or build decision because I'm looking at an application that is similar to something I can buy off the shelf. Would it be cheaper to get it off the shelf or build it? Next step would be a checkpoint for a go, no-go decision because you've gone through the building of it, you've turned it now over to the, to the quality insurance review, and then they would be responsible for actually uh, performing the work required to establish the application. Now the third checkpoint is after a postmortem, and it would say, did the implementation work or not? If it failed, then it would be returned to the submitter, 
And if it worked, it would be passed on for production acceptance through these processes. As work is done within the systems management and controls area, it goes through the system development life cycle with all these tasks performed at each step. Another way of looking at it is when you're going through a systems development life cycle, you have forms that have to be filled out through every stage of the product's life. Each of those forms can then be put into a library or uh, you can have a menu to the forms so they link out to the menu. And then from that menu, you can see the forms that are listed in maybe an Excel spreadsheet. And you can have red, green, and yellow. Red being, uh, green being that it's complete, yellow being that it's active, and red being hasn't started yet. You could then go down to the active document, click on it, and see what work is being done. A chargeback system would take the work order of the individual who submitted the request and the purchase order for all those people who were responsible for performing work against that work order and both their time and the resources they used. That cost would be tallied and then added up at the end and this would be used to charge back against the work order. This is an important issue because a lot of the projects that are done within the company are similar. So if you have a project pending that's similar to a project that's been completed, you can look at this and get a better understanding of what the cost is and what work has to be done. Now let's look at the disaster recovery site. The disaster recovery dashboard would look like this where it would have three phases. One is for planning. The other is for application recovery certification and, in essence, the IT world. And the last is for business location uh, recovery, which is for uh, business locations, for evacuation plans, and for uh, moving the, the staff from the primary location to a business recovery site. Also, status reporting would be done, would be performed to uh, various groups within the organization these groups will require the information in a different format and different period. Executives get it once a quarter, steering committee once a month, management every two weeks, and the people on the DR teams every day. Library management is also done for recovery plans, training materials, articles, standards procedures, presentations, and whatever else you deem necessary. The real recovery management board looks like this, and I'll show you that in a second. An application certification is performed like this. When an application is ready to be tested, it's tested. If it fails, it either has a gap or an exception, or it has an obstacle that's impeding its ability to perform the recovery test. That problem would then be worked on, repaired, and then made ready again for testing. If it's successful, it would be uh, have a recovery certification for high availability applications, which is uh, a failover, a fail back. There is some time, sometimes people call it seven, uh, two to 72 hours required for recovery, but there is a time span, could be two hours. Whereas in the other case, continuously available applications or gold standard applications have to be recovered immediately. In this case, you have two locations, the primary site and the secondary site that are running the same application at the same time in lock sync. So if one should fail, you can flip over to the other one and then flip-flop back and forth. So this is a flip-flop, this is a failover, fail back. In all cases, you have to be able to track recovery operations. So business recovery sites have an operations recovery manager who tracks their activities. The technical manager uh, reviews their activities and also looks at IT recoveries, and then they report to the executive management level, and they provide application certification, business recovery plans, and disaster recovery plans uh, in a listing that what has been successful, what has not, and those that are not, what actions are being taken to correct them. With that information in hand, management can then submit a letter of attestation to the, to the governing body, whether it be the SEC or whatever that controls you, saying that you are now in compliance with the recovery function. Let's take a closer look at recovery management. On the application recovery side, these boxes here are set up in two ways. One, on the outside box, 
you would get the document that's used to help you understand, in this particular case, disaster recovery exercise books. Now you can scroll through this. It's one of these fill in the blank type of things. So you fill in wherever there's a blank and you fill in the data wherever there's a yellow, stuff like that. There's also some forms that are required to be filled out because it's easier to do that, such as a contact list, which will tell you the contacts for the DRBC planning activity. And other forms like the meeting, uh, planning meeting attendees or the planning meeting agenda, which will tell you step by step what you're doing through all planning meetings. The other side to the box is the inside box. So we go in here and we say open that. And here is the disaster recovery dashboard that I spoke to you about earlier. It starts out with statements of work so you know why you're there. These are all linked. Uh, training manuals so you know what's going on. Presentations so you have a better understanding of what the company's view is. Then you have exercise booklets for the disaster recovery, which is this one. Uh, or the one you just saw, and we also have one for uh, business continuity, which is this plan here. Again, we'll show you that in a second. Then we take the uh, disaster recovery process itself, and we broke it into six steps. The recovery site infrastructure readiness, where we're taking resources from the pool, and allocating them to the application going through testing. We have planning sessions to determine what we're going to do. We have DR test pre-phase, which means once we've established that we're going to test this application, we provide the DR recovery site staff with the information they need to set up the environment so that they can support the application going through test. The application's actual DR test is then performed in which the application group would simply use the run book that they normally use in production and run it for the recovery test. Because in actuality, what they're seeing in the recovery world is the same thing you're seeing in the production world. And if it's not, it should be. So they should be able to use their run books to test the application. At the end of a test, a post-test activity is performed. In that case, we'll take the expected times against the actual times and determine what kind of deviation there is. We'll also talk about any problems that were encountered, and we'll gather all the comments made by the people who are performing the test. All that information would be gathered into a report and presentation, and that would be delivered at a post-mortem meeting so we can gain lessons learned and better our understanding of the environment from that. We would make recommendations from the meeting. Any of those recommendations that were approved would be placed into the recovery cycle and retested again. So every time you do a test, you make an improvement, you do a test, make an improvement. Eventually, by doing this, you'll have the best recovery plan possible for your organization with the fewest mistakes and fewer recommendations for improvement. It's called evolution. All right. Uh, on the other side, we have the business recovery plan. And again, we would go on the outside box to the business continuity plan, and that would tell us everything. And again, this is a fill in the blanks, stuff like that. A couple of things in this plan I wanted to point out. One is an evacuation. When you have to evacuate your site, you go normally to an assembly point. You take a head count and wait for your instructions. It's been told to me by somebody named Felix Nader, who's a an expert in this field, and that may not be the wisest way to go because today terrorists are aware of recovery plans and what happens. So they know that people are going to an assembly site. So they may cause some sort of fake disaster event at your location, forcing everybody out to the assembly point. Prior to that, they could have set up explosives around that area, and when everybody gathered, they could ignite the explosives and do a lot of damage to your staff. So their goal was not to hurt the facility, but to hurt the staff. To overcome that problem, perhaps you should utilize some sort of handheld social media device 
app and mobile phones so that when people leave, they can disperse to wherever they have to go and then call the app and register as being present. Of course, if anybody is missing, you still have to look for them. But this is a very safe way to go compared to having somebody plant the bomb in an assembly site. It's food for thought and you should consider it. Another thing I wanted to show you is that when somebody has a relocation, it's wise to provide your people with a driving route from the original point to the recovery point. This was generated by Google or by MapQuest and so on like that. But today, with everybody having GPS devices, it may be just as wise for you to provide them with the address of the recovery facility. And that might be uh, even shown to you more greatly when we go through the evacuation plan uh, test scenario that I'm going to do in a second. Okay, now we've gone through everything here. Now the evacuation plan is the, null, is the active test that I'm going to walk through in a second. Uh, whatever you do in a recovery, problems can arise. Whenever a problem arises, an action item is generated. The action item is then sent into the Contingent Command Center, whose responsibility is to coordinate all recovery activity in the company. They also communicate with the Emergency Operations Center whose function is to keep the company running as smoothly as possible, even the, in the event of a disaster. They, in turn, communicate to executive management, and executive management projects a single image to the rest of the world, and they speak to the media, to clients, to employees, to the community, and that could be um, companies that you're sharing a building with, or companies that you're sharing a business park with, the government, and families of anybody who may have been affected by the disaster event. Now let's look at the evacuation plan. What happened? There it is. Uh, okay. First of all, I want to show you that for every evacuation plan, you need to know who the contacts are. In this case, who's on the executive committee, the steering committee, who is in charge, and who are the staff of the Emergency Operations Center, the Contingency Command Center, whatever recovery teams you may have, whatever recovery vendors you have, supply chain vendors, vendors in general, the business recovery site personnel, and the disaster recovery personnel. Now, especially the supply chain people, because they're the ones who are responsible for some for providing you with supplies. Now, you're not going to be in the primary location. You're going to go to your secondary location. So they have to be notified to make the deliveries to the appropriate site. All right, let's get into the body of this. Okay, uh, A disaster event occurs. Well, what is a disaster event? A fire was recognized in a break room, and a microwave oven caught on fire. A lot of smoke is generated. It's an electrical fire. That happens all the time. This will point you to the DRT members. If you click on it, you'll get to them. This will point you to a business recovery plan, which you've seen already. So I won't click on that again. So what happens is that the disaster event occurs, and a disaster has to be declared. Now, only certain people within your organization are provided with authority to declare a disaster. The disaster recovery team leaders are notified. They notify their members, and a recovery plan is initiated with the site evacuation as the primary thing to have happen. Fire alarm sound and fire marshals escort the personnel from the site. They all meet at an assembly point, and a head count is performed, and they await further instructions. They perform the head count, and uh -oh, two people were found missing. Uh-oh, who did that? Who's in charge of it? Well, this person. So if you click on that person, you can get his name, his company, the fact he's a contractor with his phone number, his email, and his instant message information is. Now, if you're using a product or a link or anything like that, every person in your company has all that information provided by clicking on it. Now we found an action item for that event. And the action item says, two people are missing from the headcount. 
We recognize two people are missing in the head count. We continue looking for the missing people amongst the crowd. We've asked the crowd, has anybody seen him? They said, yeah, I saw him this morning, but I don't see him now. The command center is notified. They say seek advice from command. We seek advice from them. We obtain instructions from the command center. Management instructs personnel to go to a secondary site for further interviewing and or to continue work. We then talk to the first responders. The police department says, no, nobody left our perimeter. We had the whole site uh, protected. The emergency medical technician says, I haven't treated anybody. We haven't taken anybody to the hospital. The fire department turns around and says, well, you know, there was a lot of smoke in there. We didn't realize anybody was missing. Uh, we'll go back in and look a little more deeply. We notify the command center that that's occurring. And then finally, some good news comes back from the fire department. They located the two people they were unconscious and suffering from the smoke inhalation, but they're alive. So they pull them out. The emergency medical technicians start treating them on site and rush two people to the local community hospital. We are all concerned about the people and wish them a speedy recovery, but we will continue monitoring their treatment and their recovery. Management notifies the family of the two people so those families then can run to the hospital and be alongside their loved ones. Word comes back from the hospital that the two recovered, recovered people will make a full recovery and will be released from the hospital in a day or two. Everybody is euphoric. Now, in this particular case, management looks great because they took enough, they were concerned enough to actually initiate a search and lucky enough to find the people and even luckier to find that they survive and will survive and make 100% recovery. All right, we continue on with our activities, and uh, the, the Contingent Command Center, EOC, are notified the head count, missing people. They're notified when they're found. They provide instructions for the evacuated staff. Personnel instructed to go home or to a secondary location for questioning. Instructions are provided to the people who recovered. Uh, the primary site is protected by security department and local police throughout the disaster event because we have intellectual property equipment and other facilities that need to protect, be protected against theft. The salvage and restoration team is on site now because the first responders have released the building back to us and the fire is put out. The salvage people will then clean everything out, make sure it's uh, ready to be restored. The restoration people will make sure that the equipment that they can salvage and restore is available for use. The business recovery site is then notified that we are going to declare disaster and we need their facility. But when we call them, they say, we're sorry, we're full because other companies have declared a disaster as well. And our first come, first serve policy is in effect, and I'm sorry, we don't have any room for you. Uh oh, that's a problem. And that's an action item. So now we have second action item. The business recovery site is full. Executive management makes a call, try to plead with them, but unfortunately there's no room for us. And there's nothing we can do. So people are directed to go home and await further instructions from management. Those people who are able to log on from home and continue their work are encouraged to do so. These people who are authorized to log on and have computers will access the company network continue work from home. This is a good example of why sometimes you should support people from working at home. <coughs> Management then must notify the clients of the limited volume that can be handled right now, causing clients to suffer and violating service contracts for some. You're also violating, in some cases, regulatory requirements. An alternate site is located through a reciprocal agreement or a rental of an alternate space. But now some needed equipment and supplies delay startup of the recovered facility. Required equipment is determined and arrangements are made to obtain the resources. The clock is ticking. You're long past your original recovery time estimate. Finally, the resources arrive and the operation is starting to come back to normal. Work is far behind and it may be, may be hard to catch up and to calm the client's anger. All work startups starts up, personnel is stressed out, but are working very hard to get the work back to normal. 
Additional staff and work overflow is being sought through the help of other departments and vendors. Word is coming back that the primary site may be ready for reoccupancy in a few days, so arrangements must be made to return to the primary site. The salvage and restoration teams are completing their work, and the site is being scheduled for review by management to gain approval for a return to the staff. Management is anticipating that the, that the primary site will be available in a day or two, but now arrangements for return are starting to have some difficulty because return plans are altered from the original. As we were coming from a business recovery site that we knew back to our primary, now it's a whole different story. Luckily, the primary site is ready for the staff to return after an investigation is made. The EOC, CCC, and DR team have all worked very hard to come up with a new plan for recovery, for return. Management and DR teams approved the newly developed return plan, and actions are taken to initiate the plan. The newly developed return plan is initiated, and people start returning to the primary site. The primary uh, return team starts up primary site and makes preparation work to continue to normal. Normal operations are gradually brought back to the, site, to the primary site. The entire staff is finally returned to the primary site and normal business operations is restarted. Clients are notified. A slow return to normal is being accomplished. Now, claims are coming in from both clients and regulatory bodies. And now it's getting to be a problem. Executive management, legal, and order is involved. But right now, they're most concerned about finding out what happened and how we could correct that action going forward. So a post-mortem meeting is conducted. Disaster events are reviewed, and everybody comes up with a, a, a recommendation that will improve the uh, further recovery and trying to eliminate this problem from happening again. And finally, the importance of disaster recovery planning is made clear to management. Uh, about time. Management speaks to employees to thank them for their efforts. Media is briefed and clients are fully informed of both the failure encountered and the progress that will be made in the future to try to eliminate this failure from ever happening again. Well, management may have had a slap in the face with this one, but they actually came out pretty good because in the long run, what they were able to do is make a full disclosure and that's the best policy under any circumstance. All right, the evacuation is done and everything else is done. Let's go to our last board. Compliance. Compliance is involved with reviewing all the laws and regulations that the company has to adhere to worldwide. They define their audit universe, in other words, what is it that we have to comply with, how are we going to do that, and how are we going to keep it uh, on an ongoing basis. They have to eliminate any gaps, exceptions, or obstacles, and they have to be able to generate a letter of attestation saying that we are in compliance. The audit universe says, what's my audit history, what gaps and exceptions have I had in the past, what obstacles have I had in the past, how did I mediate gaps and exceptions, mitigate, excuse me, and how do I mediate obstacles. There are many laws on the books, these are only some of them, and there are strategies for eliminating the audit, audit exceptions that can be employed. A sample would be in creating a Sarbanes-Oxy or SOX uh, recovery plan. In all cases, uh, you have to report on operations recovery or audits and technical audits and executive management has to be informed of the compliance reports so that they can have a letter of attestation created and presented. And the final thing I want to show you here is a, is a, a flow chart of how you do a Sarbanes-Oxley from a risk assessment all the way through to recovery, standards, procedures, and ongoing support. All right, we've gone through the dashboard. We know what it's all about and how it works. Well, why use dashboards? Quick access to current and accurate information. It can be assessed from anywhere and anytime. It allows to drill down to the person performing the current tasks. You can connect to that person for updates and to provide assistance. 
It supports conference calls and remote meetings so everybody can be looking at the current and accurate data, which will reduce confusion and chaos amongst the staff. It's the most efficient way of handling projects and real-time work, and it's better able to makes you better able to complete projects on time and within budget. If you have any questions that you want to have answers for, please forward them to me at BronacT at DCAG. Dot com. And I'll be happy to respond any way I can. My next step. Well, if you believe that this approach can help your company improve performance and bring products and services to market more rapidly, then contact me, please, at this in these contact locations. I would love to assist you in integrating this approach within your environment. Remember, though, this approach uses your existing data so you do not have to change information to adopt to this product. What I am simply trying to do is provide you with the quickest and easiest method to get to the data most critical to you so you can make the best informed decisions and your company can run smoother because of that. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate all the time and effort that you have spent by sticking around and listening to me talk. And if there's anything I can do to help you, please don't feel just feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to help you. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the day.